rigid's an interesting word to use because it sounds very physical and it's so it's it's something that we can just kind of uh, unpack a little bit about what it means in this context so the the geometry of the vacuum is considered to be what's called the isotropic vector matrix so you can see the orange lines here um, as well as the solid more looking object in the middle is what's called the vector equilibrium where all of the vectors on the outside are of equal length and as well the vectors going towards the center are of equal length so all the vectors inside and outside are of equal length that's what makes it what Buckminster Fuller called the vector equilibrium. It's the only geometry where the vectors are the same length all around the outside as well as to the center. And in that, in that, uh, because of that, it's considered to be the geometry of the perfect equilibrium state between the radiative explosive force and the gravitational uh, inward pulling force that creates the, the boundaries that we see in the universe. Um, and so you can see then that this, this basic geometry can extend out into a matrix that can fill all space. And that's what's called the isotropic vector matrix and, or the IVM to make it a lot easier to talk about. And, um, uh, then you can see that, uh, the way Buckminster Fuller worked with this geometry was to, uh, or even discovered this initially, it was that he was working with sphere packing um, to because the universe likes to make spheres. <laughs> you, you go to the ocean and you see bubbles in the ocean and there's billions upon billions of little spheres and you see planets and stars and everything. And so he decided spheres represent the, the kind of uh, equilibrium of energy fields coming together and interacting. And so when you pack spheres together that are tangential to each other, you derive uh, this exact same geometry that you see over here when you connect all the center points of those spheres to create this vector equilibrium state and you extend that out into a whole matrix field and that gives you the isotropic vector matrix. So then you have the relationship between the tangential packing that uh, Buckminster Fuller worked with. And then what Nassim has done is take that same geometric arrangement and then he wanted to have an all, face, all space filling geometry where there are no gaps between it like you see in the tangential packing. That would allow a spherical packing to, to fill all space. And that's what he has been using to, to model the, what we call the Planck field. So each of these little these spheres are what we call a Planck spherical unit. So each sphere is, the, um, is a Planck unit length. And it's an overlapping, it's, it's electromagnetic oscillations of energy in these little toroidal spherical packets that create a standing wave pattern in this equilibrium geometry relationship. So the, the, the vector geometry that we see is the relationship of all of these center points, not an actual structure out there in the universe. It's the relationships between the spherical dynamics that are coming together into this equilibrium geometry. And um, the reason that Nassim and I were talking about it being rigid is that when you consider the, the, that each of the energy events, these little Planck spherical units that then aggregate into protons and then aggregate into atoms and molecules that aggregate into matter, that there's a gradient from the Planck scale up to the universal scale of the density of the energy, the energy dynamics. And within that gradient is then a gradient of the tension or gravitational dynamics that exists between the various energy, uh, whether it's matter or energy events, um, there's the, the ten tension gradient between them, uh, which Buckminster Fuller called that tensegrity. And when we take that 
down to the Planck scale, we, we come to an extremely high energy state because the higher the frequency of electromagnetism, the greater the energy uh, potential is within um, a given, um, you know, the, the amount of energy within one second of time, a hertz frequency has a increasing amount of energy in it as the frequency goes higher. So you take that down to the Planck scale, and you get an energy, energy state that is extremely high. <laughs> and so high, in fact, that it wants to go back to equilibrium all the time. The tension kind of dynamic is extreme. And basically, it can kind of go to infinity past the Planck scale. It can, keeps on going. Um, and so it constantly wants to go back to this equilibrium state. And that's what we refer to as the rigidity. But at the same time, it's a superfluid medium. And so it it's, will accommodate any motion and any form within it to be expressed. That's why protons, for example, are spinning within this field and they don't decay. You know, they, they, there's nothing that ever has shown a proton to decay in science and physics. And so it's, it's this structural geometry within and it's a it's a um, you know a spinning vortex within the Planck field that is in the superfluid medium within a field that wants to go back to equilibrium at all the time so that the the underlying field is what we call rigid which is a kind of a difficult word to describe it it's more like it's a its propensity to come back into the balance of equilibrium is extremely high and in that way, you could say it wants to go back into this geometry that you might refer to as being rigid. So this is the 64 geometry that Nassim uh, discovered many years ago that is um, a balance of the polarities of this isotropic vector matrix. Because when you look at a, a single vector equilibrium, it has eight tetrahedron going inward towards the center point, towards singularity. So it's very convergent towards the zero point. And it creates this balanced kind of unpolarized that can extend out from there into an isotropic vector matrix into the IBM, an unpolarized field. And when you take each of these uh, tetrahedron, the eight that are here, and you polarize each of them, so that you have now a tetrahedron that's pointing out a radiative force pointing outward to balance the gravitational force pointing inward. And you polarize each one of those, you actually get the 64 matrix. And so in essence, the 64 is the first instance of a polarized isotropic vector matrix. Whereas the Kind of the pure IVM field is unpolarized. It's non-manifest. The IVM, the VE and the IVM is the condition of energy when it's not manifest. There's no size, there's no space, there's no rotation, none of the things that we can observe in that state. And so when you polarize it, you get the 64. And what Nassim and uh, William and Amira have really discovered is that the 64 when it's polarized like this, this IVM is the first condition wherein you get a black hole um, state. Basically, it's the first instance at the Planck scale where you get mass. Whereas the prior to the 64, when it's just a pure IVM, there's no mass, there's no expression of anything, energy or mass. But when you come into a polarized condition, you get this first expression of mass at the Planck scale. And that's what they discovered is that, you know, the ratio between the Planck's on the surface to the Planck's on the volume, which is the, the formula for determining the rest mass of the proton and, you know, things like that. At this scale, it's 64 on the inside and 64 on the surface. So it's the perfect balance of the fundamental Planck field coming into a first instance of the black hole and of mass. So it's really the source of mass in that regard.